Today, I have an English short story for you. First of all, I'm going to explain some new vocabulary to you, and then I'm going to read the story. And I recommend you listen to the story at least two times. I'm going to put subtitles so you can use the subtitles, but if you want, you can also just look away and just listen to the story. I've included some of the words and phrases from both my TikTok page and also the previous English stories I did on YouTube, so watch those as well after this one, and that's going to help you to remember all these new words and phrases. Also, if there are any words that I don't explain and you hear them in the story, then check out my description below because I'm going to put a longer list of new words there. So hello everyone, anyway, thank you for coming back, nice to see you again here, um, or if it's the first time, nice to meet you, I'm Archie. Uh, let's start with our first word today. Okay, so our first word is resolute. If we're resolute about something, we're really decided, and no one can change our mind. I'm resolute to go to the dance. My parents are not going to change my mind. Number two is wobbly. If something's wobbly, it moves like this. It doesn't stay still. So if you have a table or a chair and it has three long legs and one shorter leg, then the table will be wobbly. The table will wobble. But you can put some paper under the short leg and then it won't be wobbly anymore. Or if you drink a lot of alcohol, you might be a bit wobbly on the way home. Our next one is a look of determination. If you have a look of determination, then you're resolute like this. But you could also have a look of anger, or a look of joy, or a look of excitement. So a look of just means an expression of. How does your face look? A look of. Our next one is in vain. We had this in another story. In vain means to do something without being successful at the end. I worked really, really hard for my exam, but it was all in vain. I failed anyway. So I did all this work, but at the end the result was I failed, so it was in vain. Or I asked my friend for help, but it was in vain. So he wouldn't help me, or he couldn't help me. I wasn't successful. The next one is atomic bonds. This is a scientific term, but it's in this story, so I thought I'd include it. So a bond is a connection or a link. And if you have uh, a molecule or a compound, um, then the molecules in that, or the particles in that, will be connected. And they'll be connected by a bond. And sometimes that bond is called an atomic bond. I don't remember anything about what atomic bonds are exactly uh, because I've forgotten all of my chemistry from school, but all I can tell you is it's a bond between molecules that keeps them together. Our next one is in her defence, or in my defence, or in his defence, and we use this phrase when someone's accusing us of something, someone's saying that we did something wrong or that we're guilty of something. And we can respond with, in my defence, and then give our reasons. So, for example, I'm really sorry I forgot to message you on your birthday. But in my defence, I started a new job and I've been so busy and stressed. I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten a lot of things. The next one is monotone. Monotone. Mono means one and tone is the tone of our voice. So we can speak with lots of tones, like I can go up and down when I speak, or we can speak monotone, and I don't change the tone of my voice when I speak. So if a teacher speaks in a very monotone way, then it will be very boring, and all the kids will fall asleep. The next one is doodle, or doodling. If we doodle, it means carelessly drawing. Drawing without thinking about anything, not drawing anything in particular. Usually you doodle when you're at school and you're in a class and you're bored. You're not listening to the teacher, you're just 
doing this, making shapes with your pen, maybe you're drawing hearts or drawing faces or something. Doodling is just little uh, drawings that we do when we're not thinking too much and not concentrating on something else. Shake your resolve, or that really shook my resolve. If something shakes your resolve, it shakes your determination. So resolve is connected to this word resolute. If we're resolute about something, we're decided that we're going to do it, definitely. And that is our resolve. So we have a strong resolve. But if someone shakes our resolve, like that, then it means that we're not sure about what we think now. We're uncertain about our beliefs. The idea that we had, we just don't know anymore if it's the right thing to do. He had a strong belief for this political party, but then they did something terrible and that shook his resolve and he decided to go to the other political party. I always said I wanted to go to that university, but then I met someone who was at that university and they said it was terrible and they had a bad experience. So that shook my resolve. After that, I wasn't sure what to do. The umpteenth thing, or the umpteenth time, or the umpteenth test. There's a video on my Instagram on YouTube about this phrase, and it means that we've done something, or seen something, or read something, or heard something, many, many, many times. So, that's the umpteenth news article I've read about that story. I've read lots and lots of news articles about that story. Or, this is the umpteenth time you've made spaghetti this week. Please, can we eat something else? Or, that's the umpteenth relationship that's failed. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so something that's happened many, many times. Our next one is scribble. If we scribble something, we write it in a really fast way, maybe in a very messy way. So you might scribble down your name on something. Or when you're listening to a lecture, you don't have time to write very carefully and slowly. So you scribble down some notes. Also, if you make a mistake when you're writing, you might scribble out the mistake. If we scribble it out, it's like cross out. To run dry. Literally, we use this phrase for a well. When we have a well, which is this round thing you can have, which is a hole which goes into the ground, and usually there's a string, you pull the string and up comes a bucket, and then you have water in the bucket. Now if a well runs dry, then that means at the bottom there's no more water. You've finished the water. But we use this phrase in a couple other situations to say that we don't have any more of something. So, oh, my inspiration to paint has run dry. I had inspiration, but now I've used it all up. I don't have any left. We started with some good ideas, but to be honest, after five minutes, we'd run dry of ideas. So, we didn't have any more ideas. Accusatory. If someone accuses you of something, they're saying you're guilty, you've done something. If someone says, oh, I can't find my bag, it was you, <laughs> then they're accusing that person. Now, if someone speaks to you in an accusatory way, it doesn't mean that they're directly accusing you, but the way that they're speaking suggests that they think you've done something wrong. The computers don't seem to be working. They were okay yesterday, but this morning they're not working. You were in the office last night, weren't you? So that could be accusatory. I'm not saying that it was you, but I'm suggesting that I think it was that person that made the mistake, that did something wrong. Our next one is threateningly. What a nice word. Can you try? Threateningly. 
So threateningly is a way you could speak to a person. If we threaten a person, we're saying, I'm going to hurt you if you don't do what I want. Or I'm going to tell the teacher if you do something wrong. Okay, we're telling someone we're going to do something bad to them if they don't do what we want. If I speak to someone in a threatening way, or I speak to someone threateningly, then that means that I sound like I'm threatening them. If my boss said to me, send me that document or your job will be at risk, then I know that that would be a threat and I would say he spoke to me threateningly. So our next word, to get lost in something. If you get lost in something, it means that you're so focused and absorbed and concentrating on this thing. You can get lost in a book and that's a good thing. It means that you're really focused on it and you forget about everything else. Or if you get lost in a film or you get lost in a conversation, then again, you've forgotten about everything else that's happening around you. You're just focused on that thing and enjoying that thing. Annotations. If we have a picture and we annotate it, we write some words around that picture to explain the picture. Like in science at school, maybe in biology, uh, you might have a picture of the human body and then you have to annotate it, okay? You have to draw a line and say, this is an arm. <laughs> this is an eye, okay? This is the iris of the eye. This is the pupil. So when you're explaining what's happening in a picture, by writing little notes around the picture, then you're annotating it. Sufficient. Sufficient. If something's sufficient, it means it's enough. Do you have enough paper to do the printouts you wanted? It's sufficient. It means I've got enough. Probably I wanted more, but I've accepted that this is okay. Do we have enough food for the week? It's sufficient. We've got enough. We can do with this amount of food. We can manage. We'll survive. It's sufficient. And also we have the adverb sufficiently. If you do something sufficiently, you do it enough that it's okay. The essay you wrote was okay. It wasn't great, but you did sufficiently well to pass to the next year. So you did okay. It was enough but it maybe wasn't amazing. Our next one is frizzy, frizzy, frizzy. Quite a nice word, frizzy. It sounds like fizzy, like you can have a fizzy drink, but it's got an R in it, frizzy. Frizzy is a way we can describe hair. Imagine if you get a big balloon and you rub the balloon against your head and you rub it against your head for 10 minutes after that, it's probably going to make your hair very frizzy. It's standing up. Frizzy can also mean curly, but with really little, really, really little curls. Usually it's like when you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed, your hair might be a bit frizzy. You might need to use conditioner, which will make your hair very soft and smooth because otherwise it might be a bit frizzy. Some people have frizzier hair than other people. Okay, the next phrase is in dramatic fashion. If you do something in dramatic fashion, that means in a dramatic way. Fashion can also be used to mean a way or a way of doing something. He spoke to me in a really rude fashion. That would mean he spoke to me in a rude way. The way that he talked was rude. They cooked this food in a really interesting fashion. So they cooked it in a really interesting way. But also I had a look of, so I think I was doing a British thing when I say interesting, but I don't mean it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. They cooked it in an interesting fashion. So our next word is smirk. A smirk is a kind of smile. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> So, a smirk is usually an arrogant smile. If we're feeling a little bit arrogant, we might pull a smirk. For example, if two children are arguing, one of them says, 
I know the answer, this is the right answer, I'm right, you're wrong. And the other one says, no, you're wrong, I know the answer, you're wrong, and I'm right. And then a teacher comes over and says, you're wrong, he's right. Then that child might say, hmm, you know, he might smirk because he's really pleased, he's feeling a little bit arrogant because he was right and the other person was wrong. So that's what a smirk is. A kind of smile when we feel a little bit pleased or arrogant. And the last one before reading the story is let slip. <gasps> if you let something slip, then you tell something that you shouldn't have told to anyone. So you accidentally tell a secret. For example, Tom's been on a diet, but he let slip that every day he's been storing cakes in his cupboard and eating them at night. Even in that situation, I might smirk. <laughs> so basically, if we let something slip, we're letting a secret slip. So Tom told us accidentally that he's been keeping some uh, cakes in his cupboard. Or, I didn't mean to, but I let slip that you're staying at my house tonight. Sorry, you didn't want me to say. Okay, so it's time to listen to the story. Are you ready? Sarah was resolute to pass her exam. She threw her school book down onto the wobbly, creaking table and sat down with a look of determination. She had two hours. Tomorrow is the exam, she thought, and this was her only time to study. She wouldn't let the time pass in vain. She thought back to her class with her chemistry teacher, Miss Burroughs. The last six weeks, they'd been studying atomic bonds. Unfortunately, she knew as much about atomic bonds as she did about rocket science, i.e. absolutely nothing. In her defence, as hard as she had tried, Miss Burroughs's monotone voice had only inspired daydreaming and doodling in her notebook. Anyway, that didn't shake her resolve. The subject of the test was atomic bonds, and if she didn't study, this would be the umpteenth test she'd failed, and she didn't want to imagine how her parents would react this time. She couldn't let that happen. Her phone started buzzing, and she turned it on Do Not Disturb and put it in the drawer of her desk. She scribbled down as much as she could remember about atomic bonds, before the memories of her previous class ran dry. There was a knock at the door, and although she didn't respond, her sister walked in anyway. Where's the laptop? she asked in an accusatory tone. No idea, Sarah responded angrily, pushing the door closed, almost on her sister's fingers. As Sarah removed the laptop from her bag and sat it on the desk, a squirrel loudly started to chew a nut at the windowsill, unaware of Sarah's important task. She stared at it threateningly, and as if understanding, it ran off. She went onto the school study site, opened a few books to important looking pages, and finally managed to get lost in the words, diagrams and annotations. Finally in the zone, even the smell of sausage stew, which started floating under her bedroom door and hovering under her nostrils, wouldn't stop her. For the next few hours, she piled up books next to her, chewed the ends of her hair, searched for unusual terms on Wikipedia, bit her fingernails, highlighted parts of her book at random, and spilt tea all over the table only a little going into the USB drive of the computer. It'll be fine, she said to herself. After her hair was sufficiently frizzy, her nails were short and ragged, and the pages of her books had been folded and highlighted and annotated in dramatic fashion. She got up, 
bumped her head on the ceiling and threw herself onto her bed with less anxiety for the next day. The next morning, Sarah went down to the kitchen, self-satisfied with her hard work, and her sister said, what are you so happy about? Just ready for an exam for once, that's all, she responded with a smirk. Oh, I should tell you, that laptop you had was Miss Burroughs's. She let me borrow it. She asked if I could return it today, and I mentioned that you had it. Right, so what? Well, she let slip that the test answers are on there. Oh, brilliant. I can have a look, Sarah admitted unashamedly. Actually, she said that she's going to test you on something else instead. Sarah sank her head into her cereal bowl in disbelief. Okay, so thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed the story. I recommend you watch it one more time at least, so you can really remember those words. Also, other words are written in the description too. Now, if you enjoyed this and want to support my channel, then subscribe and also like this video, and let me know if there's anything else that you would like to learn about. And what do you think? Did Sarah deserve it? She did lie to her sister about having taken the laptop, so... I'm not sure. I guess maybe she did. I'll see you next time. Have a lovely week or day.